what's fundamental? What's the bedrock of reality? For about a century now, quantum mechanics, quantum physics is the candidate. Quantum mechanics is weird. Weird not just to me, weird to physicists too. What's weird? Being a particle in a wave at the same time. No definite locations, only probabilities. Superposition, being in two places or two states at the same time. Entanglement, spooky action at a distance. Here's something else that's quantum weird. Observations could make things happen. That's crazy. Why is observations in quantum mechanics such a mystery? To find out, I've come to a private gathering of leading edge physicists. Here I'll be, Banff in the Canadian Rockies, observing nature, observing quanta. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey. Apt among the majestic mountains and verdant forests are physicists and cosmologists, philosophers too, some are old friends. Members of the Foundational Questions Institute, FQXI, where conventional wisdom is challenged. The FQXI conference is called, If a Tree Falls, the physics of what happens and who is listening. It combines two FQXI themes, the physics of the observer and the physics of what happens. I begin with FQXI's scientific director, MIT physicist and cosmologist, Max Tegmar. Max, we're here together in Banff, the fifth FQXI conference. I'm pleased it's my fourth. I was going to come no matter what the topic was, I was going to come. <laughs> but when I saw it was the physics of the observer, I wondered why is the observer, the physics of the observer, so important? We've learned that what answer you actually get out of your mathematical theories of physics depends on how you define an observer. So, for example, if you uh, just start with pure quantum mechanics, just the math, you just have this thing called the wave function doing its thing. And in order to calculate what we actually observe, that things happen with certain probabilities, if you take instead the problem of making sense of modern cosmology, where you have this huge, maybe infinite, diverse space that's been created by an inflationary expansion in our early universe, and you want to predict how much dark energy you should observe, then it turns out you instead get the right answer if you assume a little bit more about your observer, if you assume that it needs to have a galaxy to live in. There's another thorny problem in quantum mechanics where I think you have to assume even more and, and say that an observer is something which is also conscious in order to get the right answer. So that's why it's so important that we, we really drill down and understand how we define an observer because it affects the predictions. So you've made two huge leaps. The first leap is that you need something to observe the second one is that that observer might have to be conscious. Yeah, so that's another thing. Should we be surprised that we observe our universe to be 13.8 billion years old? Would it be much more likely that we would observe it to be 100 years old? Yeah. Probably not, because it was too hot then to have any galaxies or any stable structures that could process information and, and think. If we live in a very diverse space and time where for example, the amount of dark energy changes from place to place, we should expect to see the things that typical observers see. But what's typical it depends on what an observer is. And even though people here don't agree about how we should define an observer, I think they generally agree that the predictions our theories make depend on what we mean by an observer. Quantum mechanics is counterintuitive. What happens at the subatomic level makes no sense at our human level. I know enough of the math and the exquisitely precise experiments to be sure that quantum mechanics is real. But I'm baffled by the huge gap in scale between observers, sentient creatures like us, and what they observe in the subatomic realm. I put the problem to FQXI's co-scientific director, 
cosmologist Anthony Aguirre. You have to remember how physics started out. You know, it didn't always start out with subatomic particles. There were planets in the uh-huh. beginning. So, you know, when Newton first formulated his laws and uh, gravity, the universal law of gravitation, those were all astronomical objects, and you didn't have to think about observers. This was objective reality. Mm-hmm. But a really interesting thing happened, of course, in the beginning of the 20th century when all of this basically fell apart with the advent of quantum mechanics. And, you know, physicists resisted it. They, they saw that as they tried to formulate the laws of the very small, they found that, you know, whatever you do, your act as an observer just inevitably affects it. And this seemed at first like, well, that's just an annoying thing. But the more people kind of studied it, they found that this was not just a sort of an artifact irritating of the artifact. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was a part of nature that not only could you inconveniently affect things, you inevitably affected things. And so, starting then with with sort of the creation of quantum mechanics, it, the observers become sort of more and more wrapped up in physics. You can't describe quantum mechanics without talking about the observer. How do you distinguish between the uh, observer being a a sentient being Mm -hmm. and a measurement device? I'm looking at a tree. I'm the observer that's looking at the tree. But when we're talking about a subatomic particle, we take that tiny thing and sort of amplify the information in it up to a scale that is useful and and sort of on a macroscopic level Mm -hmm. where I I can look at the readout on the machine. But where does the observation actually take place? I'm reading, you know, a little dial out. I'm observing the quantum system. So now are you part of it too? Am I part of it too? Am I part of the quantum system? Or does the buck stop with me? You know, where I'm ultimately the observer has to be something like me that thinks, that that imagines, and so on. And I think we don't really know what is enough to, to make the observation happen. What does it mean to observe? What does it feel like to observe? We're talking physics while rafting the rapids. This limit, it turns out that uh, in, in a, 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 a period of uh, over time t, when the light cone or something over time t, you can only have t squared divided by the Planck time squared events. That's the max, otherwise it forms a black hole. The physics is demanding, but enlightening. The rafting is challenging, but invigorating. I'm trying to follow the flowing concepts of the simple observer and hovering theories of quantum mechanics. And I'm trying to observe the simple beauty of the flowing river and hovering mountains in the Banff wilderness. I'm trying to do both at the same time. I cannot. I'm observing myself trying to observe. I'm getting a headache. Observation is pervasive. But is observation fundamental? Surviving the rafting, I steady my step. Just as it's crucial to select the right routes in the waters, in clarifying scientific problems, it's crucial to ask the right questions. I seek a philosopher of physics to articulate the right questions. I find David Wallace. David, the observer has been a a concept since the beginning of quantum physics almost for a century now. Why are we still talking about the observer? Yeah, it's kind of strange, isn't it? And I think there's there's three reasons that have come up in this conference. One line people have is that there's something about human consciousness that somehow we don't understand deeply and that somehow physics can tell us how to get to grips with. The second thing's been running through the physics of the 20th century for a long while, which is that somehow quantum mechanics, our best theory of the really small, requires the observer as a central part of how to formulate it. In cosmology, we seem to be being told that the universe is infinite, or if it's not infinite, it's fantastically large. It's so large that we'd expect there to be versions of this conversation, this interview happening many, many times, maybe an infinite number of times across other bits of the universe. It doesn't matter how unlikely it is, if you get to try it infinitely many times, it'll happen infinitely many times. So doing the, the physics of what we should expect to observe in cosmology seems uncomfortably to need us to think about 
what the observers are in cosmology. So there are three different kinds of observers dealing with three of the biggest questions in science, consciousness, quantum mechanics, and cosmology. Are there any uh, commonalities among those three? Well, I think it's more these are three different sets of questions we might ask mm. about observers. Mm. So both in the quantum case and the case of cosmology, what we seem to mean by observer is something like you know, a system that records, maybe a system that can make inferences based on the recording, but they're doing very different things. So in quantum mechanics, the observer is, is kicking back, is, is doing something to, to the physics. And it's exactly that kickback that makes a lot of people, including me, a bit skeptical that the observer should do something special in quantum mechanics. Right. And I think in the cosmology side, I mean, maybe it's not even the human as observer, it's something like the observing system. And what, you know, one of the things cosmologists rightly, I think, are trying as hard as possible to avoid having to do is to have to build a theory of how our cosmological observations work that requires to drill down to the specifics of exactly how humans work. And we kind of feel that right observational theory you know, shouldn't depend on the exact wirings of my brain. And sure. if, if we have to answer questions about the exact wiring of my brain to predict what we see in the night sky, then I think we're in trouble, frankly. Yeah, right, right, right. What we need is more something like what's a general framework for systems that can observe, can Record, can try to confirm or refute scientific theories, and how should we understand how those, those systems engage with something as difficult as cosmology? David poses three questions about the observer. Is an observer needed to make quantum mechanics work? Must the observer be a conscious entity? Why are observers relevant in cosmology? Each of the questions touches fundamental issues. I start with the quantum. Here's the core conundrum. How does our normal definitive world emerge from the quantum probabilistic world? And what's the role of observers? I ask physicist, cosmologist, author, Sean Carroll. Basically, every college physics department that teaches quantum mechanics tells the students the same thing, and almost no physicist really believes it. And the thing we tell them is that there are quantum mechanical systems, like a nucleus that might decay or an atom that might radiate. And what quantum mechanics is able to tell you is when you, as an observer, make an observation of the system, what is the probability that you see different experimental outcomes? Mm -hmm. And so the very formulation of the rules of quantum mechanics, as we teach in the textbooks, involves the existence of an observer. But deep in the heart of almost every physicist is the conviction that the existence of a person, mm -hmm. which is what it sounds like when yeah. you say the word observer, that shouldn't be part of a real physical theory. So there's sort of a minority of physicists who've taken up the radical point of view that, no, 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 you can't even define quantum mechanics without really taking observers seriously as part of the fundamental ingredients of the theory. The rest of us are trying to say, well, what we really meant all along by observers is something else. Some part of the system that interacts with some other part of the system in another way. So I, for one, am happy to count video cameras, rocks, uh, atoms and molecules in the air as quantum mechanical observers for all intents and purposes. So an observer can be any kind of interaction? No necessity for a living, sentient kind of observer? I confer with quantum information expert and FQXI regular, Seth Lloyd. Every physical system ranging from the size of elementary particles like electrons up to the human beings, society itself, or stars and planets, or even the whole universe can be considered an observer because Every physical system is interacting with its surroundings and getting information about it. So if getting information about the rest of the universe is observing it, then even an electron is an observer. But a hundred years ago, when quantum mechanics came to the fore, then an observer plays a more central role because you can't get information about a, a physical system, a quantum mechanical system, without disturbing it. And that type of uh, disturbing is uh, measurement classically, but does that have to have a sentient observation, as some have claimed, which sounds <laughs> incredible. <laughs> the problem in quantum mechanics is that you have this quantum weirdness called wave-particle duality, where 
know, electron over here corresponds to a wave over here. Electron over there mm -hmm. corresponds to a wave over there. But electron here and there at the same time yeah. corresponds to wave in both <laughs> places at once. So then the question is, why do we see electron in one place rather than another? And the notion of, a, of an observer is invoked to say, oh, electron will show up either here or there if an observer comes in to see that it's here or see that it's there. And the observer in that case is a measurement, not necessarily a sentient creature. Right, but if the measurement apparatus is itself a quantum mechanical system, then... Which, which everything is. Which everything is, then actually the quantum description of what's going on is not either measurement apparatus finding it here or measurement apparatus finding it there, but measurement apparatus yeah. finding it here and there simultaneously, and that's kind of a bummer. <coughs> and so Wigner and others actually said, well, what could it possibly be that makes things finally be here or there rather than here and there at the same time? And mm. he said consciousness for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> to Seth, like to Sean, an observer in quantum mechanics need not be a conscious being, though it can be. That sounds sensible, while requiring a conscious observer sounds ludicrous. Yet some here at the FQXI conference take consciousness very seriously. I know a philosopher of mine who argues that consciousness goes beyond physics. Dave Chalmers is here in Banff. It's hard to begin to talk about observers without talking about consciousness. You know, maybe you can find a notion of observation so that anything that affects one other thing, then the other thing is making an observation. I get the sense that when these physicists are talking about observers, they're talking about something a lot more robust than that. They're talking about something like us, when we perceive the world and experience what's going on, and that's a kind of act of consciousness. So what, what is the nature of consciousness that could, it, it could affect quantum physics before there were sentient creatures? There's a number of different possible roles for observers in physics. One role is just epistemological. For example, the very fact that we are here as conscious observing beings tells us something about the universe, which puts some constraints on the physics of the world. And that's a less controversial role for observers. Some people would have consciousness playing a very fundamental role that it wouldn't exist without the conscious process. So that's the more radical thesis. <laughs> In the traditional formulations of quantum mechanics, it says there's this wave function and it evolves, and every now and then there's a measurement or there's, there's an observation. And when that happens, something changes. The wave function collapses into a new state. And suddenly it looks like observation, consciousness, is playing a role in the dynamics. And for a lot of people, that's hard to stomach, and they've tried to find ways out. You mentioned a, a problem. Wasn't the wave function evolving for a long time before consciousness ever came along? Well, I suppose one view is that, yeah, well, for all those you know, billions of years or whatever, the wave function was just evolving without collapsing. And suddenly in one branch, the first conscious observer came along and then collapsed the wave function into a definite state for the very first time. Now that's a radical that's, view, yeah. but on this view, this is a view where consciousness actually plays a role in creating determinate reality. I hear that physicist Paul Davies makes consciousness fundamental. Can he explain the eons of time before conscious beings appeared? There's a simple answer and a more subtle answer to that. The simple answer is, well, something can be fundamental but not always be there. So uh, particular fundamental particles, say um, uh, the electron, probably didn't exist during the first split second mm. of the universe. Mm. So that's a sort of simple explanation. But there's a more subtle one. And that is uh, in quantum physics, the relationship between events across time is rather different from what it is in sort of daily life and, and common sense. Uh, and that's because uh, the act of observation today uh, can not only affect what's going to happen in the future, uh, but in some sense constrains what happens in the past. And this was spotted by John Wheeler, uh, the great uh, theoretical physicist who uh, devised a, a thought experiment called the delayed choice experiment, but the upshot being that the observer could choose 
uh, whether to make one type of measurement or another, and which choice uh, the experimenter made would affect the nature of reality at the other end in the past. <laughs> And so it looks like retro-causation, and that is true in a sense, but it's not that we can change the past by making choices of what to observe. Now, we're not changing the past, but we're constraining the nature of past that was. In quantum physics, you have fuzziness and incomplete information about the world, and so there are many, many possible pathways that connect the Big Bang with our present state. And when we do an observation, we reduce the number of possible pathways that could exist. And so in that sense, what we do today affects the nature of reality as it was in the past. It doesn't change the past. So in that somewhat abstract sense, uh, observers today are still relevant to the quantum physics of the Big Bang. The emergence of conscious beings at some stage in the universe is fundamental to the actual workings of the universe. It's not an incident. To Paul, as to Dave, consciousness is fundamental. You can't have an observer without having consciousness, and this includes the subatomic level of quantum physics. But problems of the observer are not confined to the microscopic. Something's also going on at the supergalactic level of cosmology. What's the meaning of the observer in cosmology? I start with the scientist who pioneered the theory of cosmic inflation, Alan Guth. Well, it does re-enter in cosmology, I was okay, well, how, going to be how saying. So? Okay. Uh, because it comes about because of this problem of eternal inflation and the difficulty of defining probabilities in eternal inflation. Anything that is allowed by the laws of physics will happen ultimately an infinite number of times. So to say that something is more common than something else you're comparing infinities, and there's no unique way of doing that. Because we really do need to talk about not solely what happens physically, but we need to talk about what we expect observers to see. So the observer enters okay. by basically picking out parts of this multiverse, which are the parts where observers live, and we have to condition our probabilities uh, on those observers. So an observer in cosmology really has a different characteristic than the observer, which is a measurement or an interaction in quantum mechanics. Uh, the observer in cosmology sounds like a real observer, yeah, as opposed right. to uh, a measurement or an interaction in quantum mechanics. Is that right? That's, that's, that is right. That's exactly right. There's an oddity of observers in cosmology. How could the universe be so finely tuned as to permit observers? I asked cosmologist Bernard Carr. I would say the link with cosmology came through the, the anthropic principle and the fact that the, the universe seems to be fine-tuned for the existence of observers. In other words, the fact that we're here asking questions about the universe seems to impose certain constraints on, on the constants of nature and, and the appearance of the universe. So that, if it, were the, if it were true, would suggest that the presence of consciousness in the universe actually does play a role. That's not saying that you've got a theory of consciousness. Sure, sure. But it's saying that consciousness does affect the appearance of the physical universe. So be, because the, whatever characteristics you need to have consciousness, which are galaxies forming and stars and planets and humans and uh, this whole sequence of events, whatever the physics that you need for those events to produce consciousness, you have to, you have, to have, and that's the structure of the universe we find or we wouldn't be here to be asking the questions. The idea of an observer as uh, part of a fine-tuned universe is also very controversial among of physicists. Of course, and, and all, most, all these ideas are controversial. And, and, Winds, waves, mountains, forests. Only observers bring beauty to nature. We are observers. Observation is a primary feature of sentient beings. Further, observation in some broad sense is what separates reality into distinguishable parts. The deep question is whether observation affects, changes the external world. In quantum mechanics, the wave function describes probabilities of states of systems. But what transforms probabilities into actualities, 
such as the precise position of a particle. There seems to be only two kinds of answers. Either observation is needed to collapse or decohere the wave function from a probability smear to a single defined location, or the so-called many worlds interpretation, a story in itself, branches reality into innumerable histories and futures. Each answer is fantastical. Either consciousness somehow affects, changes the external world, or there is a virtual infinite number of total worlds, including countless versions of ourselves, all somehow existing in parallel. Fantastical is indeed the watchword for whatever is closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.